Sessions. Better Business for All Meet the Regulators Week. Um, we've got we've got two sessions today. Uh, this this morning we've got uh, Martin Harland and Mike Chambers at Warwickshire County Council Trading Standards presenting on what a trading standards officer does. Uh, and then this afternoon at 2 p.m. we've got a session from uh, Coventry and Warwickshire Growth Hub. You'll find uh, the links to all the remaining sessions uh, during the week on the PDF scheduled document that's been circulated by email previously. Um, the usual uh, Teams housekeeping applies. Uh, please stay on mute and leave your camera off unless you are talking. Uh, please do use the chat if you have any comments or questions to make so, so that we can make this as interactive as possible. Um, you can also raise your virtual hand if you've got a question at the end. Um, it, it, it is being recorded. I can see that Stuart started it. Um, so without further delay, I'd like to thank uh, both Martin and Mike for taking the time to, to present today uh, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks Stuart. Um, morning everyone. Welcome to Warwickshire uh, Trade Standards and um, yeah Mark and I have been tasked to talk about what a trading standards officer does. And we put together a presentation which hopefully will come through uh, in a moment. Somebody can confirm that's the case. Yeah, yeah. we can see yeah, that. Yeah, we've got that. Okay. Um, let me set it off. Start. There we go. Um, yeah. Morning all. Basically, Warwickshire Trade Standards, what do we do? What does Trade Standards Service do? <clears throat> the aim of our service is to work in partnership to keep our citizens safe and support legitimate businesses and protect consumers. That's a big strap line, really. Um, and in lots of authorities, we're known as consumer protection um, and um, public protection and so forth. And basically, we're out there making sure that anything that you buy as a consumer or any business that operates with consumers works in a safe way and provides safe goods and services. Historically, um, we came from the Weights and Measures Inspectors Inspectorate, um, and that's historical, it goes all the way back, right, a thousand years plus, um, Weights and Measures, and it's got a very strong history. And that played all the way through until the late 60s with the advent of the Trade Descriptions Act 1968. And that sort of changed us into trading standards officers. And that's where the term sort of comes from from those days, even though it's not a prescribed term, it's not um, a legal name for us um, in any shape or form. That's where it comes from. The Trade Descriptions Act um, encompass the fact about how goods are described, um, whether it should be correct. Um, there was other aspects about services and people trading correctly from that point of view. Um, and from there on, there's been more and more consumer legislation. And um, unfortunately, the Trade Scripture Attack now is just um, a small part of what we do. And because a lot of the uh, original offences have moved on, and it's now in a much bigger scope with the consumer safety and consumer protection legislation. And a lot of that came from Europe, which we've just obviously now left. Um, and that's now been transposed post Brexit into UK laws. So the legislation is still the same. But the current government is looking at changing that going forward and making it more UK focused than it's been. Um, but there's still a lot of controls out there from everything to do with animal health to um, electrical safety to um, fair trading in terms of terms and conditions. Um, the whole gamut across the board is, right, is really large. 150 statutory acts, 1500 regulations and more. Um, it keeps growing um, despite the fact they keep saying they've got to cut regulation. It seems to be that we always seem to get more. There is enforcement. Um, there's the main Themes, metrology is the um, proper name for weights and measures. Animal health, um, current things on the go has been avian flu, which have had outbreaks in Warwickshire and we dealt with. Illegal puppies, um, there's also <clears throat> farm animals, and it's about the, you know, from food to fork, um, from peel to fork. So, and it, everything to do with animal health 
and how um, the animals are produced, right through to their slaughter, the production of meat, um, through to the fork. So um, it's a huge range of issues with that. Food labelling goes on the top of that and food safety, making sure that everything's safe that we eat, it's correctly labelled, it's correctly, the ingredients are correctly identified. One of the key things at the moment is allergens. Um, there's new labelling come on pre-packed food for that, um, that we're busy getting business up to speed on, which came in October last year. Product safety, we've got toys, cosmetics, prams, um, electrical items, um, huge range of stuff. And then there's even a general catch-all called general product safety, whereby um, goods have got to be deemed to be safe with minimal risk. It doesn't say no risk, but minimal risk to consumers to use them. We do underage sales, um, knives and alcohol and tobacco are there. They're the big ones. Vapes is another thing that's just taken off at the moment and we're um, looking into. We also even cover the likes of crossbows and glues, um, spray paints um, and other items like that. Moving on, fair trading, that's arguably the biggest area that we cover. It's a very broad range. I mean, I've just got two things there, pricing and misdescriptions. It's all about terms and conditions. It's how traders conduct with you, what you see online, etc. Um, it's very wide ranging um, in terms of its scope. Um, and we tackle where there's misleading omissions, whether things are false in terms of the descriptions um, and even um, Misleading practices like harassing people um, if they're um, doing visiting your home and um, a, a builder or something like that, they can't keep you entrapped while you sign on the dotted line for something you don't want to do. Um, there's doorstep crime, again, that's IT you know, roofers, builders, landscapers, tree fellers. Um, there's a lot of that goes on where the people just do IT you know, knock on the door and targeting individuals um, directly. Um, people are more vulnerable in their own homes and make decisions in different ways than they would do probably in a shop. So we do a lot of work with that. And um, finally at the bottom is intellectual property, that's counterfeit goods, um, trademarks and so forth. It's about brand protection, making sure that um, goods uh, there are the genuine ones and people know that. And very often if they're counterfeit, um, they could be um, unsafe. For example, we just had a complaint literally yesterday about counterfeit car chargers um, for charging electric cars. So um, anything and everything can be counterfeit these days, so it's no big surprise. The other way to get involved is business advice. Um, through that, there's primary authority, which is formal relationships we can have with companies um, in terms of giving advice and helping them to make sure that they comply with the legislation. Um, there's a register for that so people can look up um, who has a primary authority relationship and see what advice they've been given. There's projects and campaigns um, that we do and carry out, theme pieces of work, for example, like the vapes thing I've already mentioned. We do the, the allergens, this new thing coming in, so we've done some work there. We do publicity when things take off, Dorset crime in a particular area, something like that. We um, highlight the problems so people are aware of that. And in recent times, obviously, responded to COVID-19, which is something that obviously nobody planned for or expected, but we've had to deal with going forward. So how we work with all that, we have a general enforcement policy, advises us what to do, directs us in terms of the issues, um, so we can prosecute in court, but we can do anything from warning letters to get undertakings. Um, but the primary thing is to make sure that businesses comply and it's talking to business and getting them to do the right thing from the start. So that's by advice, achieving compliance through inspections and so forth. We are an intelligence-led service. We don't just put a finger in the air and think what we're going to do. We actually look at the information coming through and other intelligence sources. Um, the Citizens Advice Consumer Service, which do all the consumer advice in the UK for trading standards, and we get feedback from them on a daily basis, reports of um, various problems, and we look at the form of those and some of those respond to directly and some of those we might just monitor to get more intelligence and then take some form of targeted action. National Training Standards is a body that an umbrella body that sits above us um, and it determines sort of strategy in a national sense because sometimes these problems are on a national scale they're not just a local or a regional problem and so we have this overarching body which helps us direct that and control that and provide some funding to do certain targeted pieces of work. 
Um, the regional work is done through a body called Sensa, which is Central England Trading Standards Authorities. There's 14 of us in um, the makeup Sensa, including Warwickshire. And again, we do regional work, we share expertise and practice um, and so forth, like the allergens, there's Commonwealth Games coming up, so we're doing joint work with that and so forth. Here's our business plan. Um, it's got and it's unusual. We've got a three year plan starting last year and it's really good in terms of directing what we're trying to do here. We've got these four priorities, these themes, um, protecting those from the highest risk of harm, the worst impacts of financial hardship, um, and identifying and removing dangerous products in the marketplace, supporting businesses to diversify and adapt to new circumstances post COVID and establishing strong partnerships to keep our community safe, working with other regulators, working together with the police, licensing, environmental health and so forth. And overall, there uh, is to achieve the aim of creating a fair and safe trading environment and supporting businesses, which is what the authority promotes overall. Um, so there are broad themes and virtually anything that I've mentioned before in terms of the different areas we enforce falls into those themes and we can direct ourselves going forward. So just covering one or two other bits and pieces that we do do, we've got a metrology unit um, doing the weights and measures. And there's a photo of um, a tanker being tested with a fuel meter. Um, and that's important clearly, because if you're having fuel oil um, at the moment, and that's not even price capped with all the other energy crisis going on, it's astronomical in price. You want to make sure if you're buying a thousand litres, you are getting a thousand litres. And I did have a case in London where these tankers were fraudulently tampered with letting air in. So you're metering air at the same time, so you're getting a lot less. Um, so fraud does go on with tankers. Um, weighing machines, so making sure that if you go and buy um, 500 grams of cheese um, at the cheese counter in the supermarket, then that's what you get. Petrol pumps, again, making sure you get the right amount of fuel. Um, capacity measures, making sure you get your pint of beer. Um, making sure you get four pints of milk in your carton or whatever. Length measures, um, so obviously that's down to measuring materials. Um, and it's critical, obviously, we get those length measures right. And again, even for um, sporting um, situations like the Commonwealth Games, you know, world record, how do you know it's 200 metres or whatever it is um, if you don't have the correct measure of length to prove the point? Um, Weigh bridges, weighing of lorries, making sure they're safe on the road, that the axles are not overloaded, because if they are overloaded, then the vehicle may become unsafe because it can't brake as quickly as it should do, um, or it may be more dangerous to drive in other ways. So um, they have a vital role to play. And we do have our own public weigh bridge. And even last week, we did a joint piece of work with the police. Uh, they were pulling in vehicles and they found overloaded skip lorries. Um, and other uh, lorries and uh, dynamic axle wares they're just um, a smaller scale run having a big um, weigh bridge which is a giant weighing machine they've just got these plates where the wheels sit on them and then it weighs the vehicle from there so it's just a slightly different situation animal health um there's two unfortunate pictures of animals not in a very good situation um there, they're not got clean hay and um, straw. There's a lot of mud about. Um, the, certainly the sheep look at a bit in poor condition. And it's making sure that they're OK. And the animals on the right there are the cattle. There's a lot of junk there. They could injure themselves and hurt themselves. There's a tire um, and so forth. And just making sure that animals are in the right environment to make sure they're safe, they're healthy. Uh, they've got access to food and water so they can um, thrive properly. And that's me concluded. So I'm moving over to Mike to take over from now. Thank you, Martin. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Chambers. I work with Martin as part of the uh, the management team at Warwickshire Trading Standards. Um, I'm going to do a, a few words this morning about um, counterfeit uh, tobacco and counterfeit goods in more detail and um, cover a few successful court cases uh, we've had uh, which illustrate how trading standards work in, in the field of fraud. Um, we talked about at the start well, what does a trading standards officer do and I would say what does a trading standards officer do normally? Um, I don't think we could have anybody could have predicted the challenges that we had 
from uh, the coronavirus. And as Martin alluded to earlier, we also had a problem uh, just before Christmas with avian flu. So we've, we've had a lot to deal with. So if I kick off by talking about um, counterfeit and illicit tobacco. Now, um, this is a, this is a challenge for us in, in Warwickshire as it is th through throughout the UK. I think everybody uh, identifies with the impact of uh, illegal illegal tobacco um, that is far reaching. It's often part of a, a wider criminality, and we've all seen the links to uh, drug smuggling, people trafficking, and illegal alcohol production. Um, it also uh, the the availability of cheap cheap tobacco uh, is, is is significantly undermines the effects of higher taxation on efforts to reduce the number of people that smoke. So there's major public health crossover in the work that we do. Um, the slide that you can see uh, in, front of, in front of us now is um, uh, taken on a visit last year by members of uh, the Warwickshire team. Uh, they were acting on intelligence received relating to uh, the supply and distribution of uh, illegal tobacco. Uh, and, and as I say, this was in um, a storage yard. And, you, and as you can see, it was full of uh, big storage units like that. And uh, our dog uh, identified immediately where in a uh, uh, quite large field this um, this unit was. And as you can see, we discovered in one of the units uh, boxes of, of uh, different brands of tobacco waiting to be uh, collected and distributed to local outlets. Can I have the next slide, please, Martin? OK, so um, some further photographs of that particular visit. And it, it shows that you can never predict what you're going to find on, on, on these jobs. And it shows the sheer challenges that our officers face. So they're out there. Uh, looking for uh, tobacco, um, the the, the units themselves were in a field which was extremely muddy and dirty, and it was dark. Um, the dog, uh, who is also trained to um, detect uh, drugs, managed to find uh, what we identified later as a underground cannabis farm. So there were the plants, and as you can see, all the lighting and and water and electricity. Um, uh, set up for the large scale production of cannabis plants. So that, that was a, quite a surprise. The police were really happy about that. And they also found some uh, stolen uh, and chopped up um, cars and uh, motorbikes as well. So from that particular visit, you can see uh, we took away uh, uh, quite a large amount of cigarettes and hand rolling tobacco. Um, since we've been uh, concentrating in this area from June uh, 21 to, to to date, you can see um, the numbers of uh, cigarettes and hand rolling tobacco that we've uh, seized in in just that short period. So it, it does illustrate that the that this is this is a major problem, and and the more we dig, the the more we find, and we, our plan is to work closer with um, partners such as the police and HMRC to get further up the chain and try to work out the, 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 um, the link to what we know uh, are major organised crime groups. Um, can I have the next slide please, Martin? Now, this is our major challenge for the morning. Um, uh, we have put a, a, a short video uh, it should, I don't think it's got sound, but um, if you can play it, Martin, please. So we use um, tobacco detection dogs uh, on, on our on our search visits. Uh, tobacco is concealed in all sorts of weird and wonderful places these days. And you can see that the dog has indicated with its handler. You can see that the, the, the cigarettes in this case were concealed in um, a sewer. Now, we don't know what is actually in these products to start with, but I wouldn't be happy smoking anything that had been 
stored in a sewer and you can see that the that you know that the, the dog's really happy with what it's found um it's looking up now to, to, to they, um, the handler gives it a, a tennis ball so that dog called um yo-yo was extremely effective uh, on the day in, in in identifying quite um a large amount of uh of um of seized tobacco um we ask our officers to get involved in in in, in some um horrible uh, uh places um farms and you, you you saw the industrial uh premises on the previous slide but i think the officer that dealt with this one went um uh, above and beyond um in having to put a hands and head into an open sewer to um retrieve um the product so um, it, it never amazes me um by you know how how clever these people are in hiding stuff and hats off to the uh, the officers who found found all that can i have the next slide please okay so um another strand of, of, of the, the counterfeit sector is is uh these counterfeit goods um this this is a major and will has been and will be a major priority for us going forward um obviously uh counterfeit goods are uh, a major threat to legitimate business in as much as they stifle competitive growth of, of legitimate brands and there are also links uh, that the funds from selling counterfeit goods go to um, organized crime groups we know that from the uh, intelligence that we've received um warwickshire has um, two of the largest uh, outdoor markets in the uk at Furness End and the airfield at Wellsbourne. Um, we've paid a few visits to uh, Furness End Market um, in, the, in the last year, one of which was in November 2021. And you can see from the slide a picture of the store there selling um, uh, branded goods. Um, we went with the, the police and a representative from the trademark holders. And you can see from the uh, image on the right hand side that that um, one visit alone uh, seized enough goods uh, to fill a 40 foot um, lorry. Um, and we could have done uh, many this many times over. Um, it's our intention to, to, to carry on this, this work with, with, with the markets and also have further conversation with um, the owners uh, of the land and the operators of the market because we, we, we believe that um, there's more that they can do and indeed there is certain um, uh, uh, legal obligations upon the uh, owner of the land and the operator of the market in, in relation to receiving uh, proceeds of crime from the sale of um, branded goods which they know to be counterfeit. So you can see from the the, the lorry example, the, the there was um, branded clothing, watches, footwear, jewellery, cosmetics, uh, tobacco, and quite alarmingly a quantity of electrical goods, which is not only an, a, an issue from the uh, the trademark perspective, but also obviously they won't have undergone the stringent uh, testing uh, that uh, that um, the real uh, goods will have done so there might be a fire safety or risk of a, a electrocution when people are using them okay next slide thanks so i've listed there uh, um, the other ongoing work that we've got on and just, just to pick a few out of those because I'm conscious of, 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 of times ticking on. Um, just to uh, um, illustrate the, the, the breadth of the sort of work that we do, um, at the top there there's um, an investigation that's ongoing at the moment into our hair dye products um, available from um, a, a, a national um, supplier um, that had unfortunate um, uh, effects upon its user and causing it an extreme adverse effect. So we're trying to isolate now which um, constituent part of that hair dye 
caused the problem, uh, which which was extremely serious. We also we're also, as Martin alluded to earlier, looking at recalls of a, a kit car that's produced uh, outside of, of of the UK. Um, I think Martin the, 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 the had um, issues like the steering wheel fell off um, while the car was being driven. So I mean, you, you can obviously see that's a serious problem there. Um, we are also looking at um, CBD products. Don't ask me to pronounce the word above it because I can't. Um, and we're looking at product strength claims within those products. Um, a, a national um, company again, uh, and obviously uh, that's ongoing. Martin mentioned Natasha's law and allergens, and we also receive um, funding from uh, national trading standards to do uh, safety at ports, and that involves checking safety of goods that are imported through into the UK through Coventry Airport. So we're looking at uh, um, cosmetic products, toys, and 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 the like. Next slide, please, Martin. So just briefly, a, a few um, successful recent cases. This um, particular uh, case here is um, a company um, based in Tamworth that offered um, uh, services to, to people to uh, correct uh, alleged, and I say alleged, um, damp in their houses. Their, um, their um, MO was to um, cold call uh, and target um, deliberately, in my view, um, vulnerable and older uh, residents uh, and offer them a free uh, damp proof uh, survey in their home. Um, when visited, um, surprisingly, they had damp in, in their house and this had been the case for a number of years. And unfortunately, several um, residents were uh, duped into in signing agreements uh, that totaled a, 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 around three and a half thousand pounds. Um, mistakenly believe then from the salesman that um, they've got a serious damp problem uh, and they needed it to be uh, corrected then and there. They were conned into signing away their, their cancellation rights, which they have in law. And when we had the work examined by a surveyor, it was, he said it was unnecessary in the first place, uh, i.e. there was no evidence of damp. And if it had been fitted in the correct manner, um, it, it wouldn't have solved the problem anyway. And the work they did was was defective. Um, company pleaded guilty and um, were ordered to pay over £21,000. The pleading bit for us well, was that um, um, the court ordered that these um, people uh, the victims were compensated in full, and it's often our experience that people sign away, you know, their their life life savings in in this sort of in this sort of calm. Um, can you do the next one, please, Martin? This is a bit unusual. This one, um, and was back in 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 two thousand and thirteen. This involved um a timeshare fraud. Um. Not with um, the usual uh, premises and, or flats or houses, but in this case, um, uh, yachts. Um, victims were uh, offered a, a part share in a, a, a berth in a yacht, which was um, moored at a port in in, uh, in Turkey. Um, this the scale of the fraud was was a, around 100 victims and the amount it, uh, was around seven and a half million pounds. So this is, is no uh, no small um, uh, operation. It, it was a, deli a deliberate attempt by the directors to operate in a fraudulent manner. And you can see uh, from there that um, when it got to Crown Court, uh, one of the directors was sentenced to four and a half years. Now, um, Quite, the, the, the pleasing thing for us in, in this is there's a, a piece of legislation called the Proceeds of Crime Act, which when um, uh, um, fraudsters, as in this case, profit from uh, their ill-gotten gains uh, um, and, and fraud, the court can order uh, an amount that it thinks is is the benefit of of the uh, the offences, 
and um, it, 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 it awards to um, various parties an, an amount in confiscation. So in this case, we get a third, a third goes to the victims and a third goes to the state. So it's a very effective tool in, 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 in combating fraud and more importantly, getting the monies back to the victims who most deserve it. And we get um, a, a, a cut of it as well. Obviously, um, you know, we can't spend it on a, a, a new, a new uh, jag for the office, but it goes to be invested in future in enforcement uh, activities. And this is the, the gift that keeps on giving because this was such a complex case. Every time a, a, a boat is disposed of from this particular company, um, the, the, the proceeds of crime order is still uh, valid and, and we get a nice little um, sum through the post from the court, which is great. Next one, please. So very quickly, I mentioned our um, role in, in responding to, to, to the coronavirus. Um, very quickly, um, we had to establish a means of communicating between us as a county council and the five districts and boroughs. So we developed a, an, an intel and, and tasking group, um, which was set up to um, enable us to task um, work from um, various parts of the council to the districts and boroughs to share intelligence and, to, and basically to support each other. Now, um, we're very fortunate in, in trading standards. We've got an excellent um, intelligence team that supports us in, in, in the work that we do. And effectively, that, that, that team runs uh, this group. Um, the, not only did we do lots of very, very good work in, uh, the, to uh, combat the virus, we've now moved on to um, other projects such as sale of vapes and also um, extra work uh, regarding um, the Commonwealth Games. So um, that has been a positive, if there has been any positives out of uh, uh, the virus, in as much as we chose, we uh, seized the opportunity to work more effectively with our partners. Strength and it did receive a, a national award for um, best collaborative uh, working initiative last year. So that's a really positive thing to come out of um, the coronavirus. Um, next stage, next slide, please, Martin. So there's just a, a few numbers uh, about how effective um, the team was. Now, I, I, I'm not going to um, do the next slide because that's about the Commonwealth Games, and I don't want to run over the time we've been allotted. But what I will say is, Thank you for uh, listening to what we've had to say today. Um, I think it, it, the last couple of years has been unprecedented in, in the challenges that it's thrown up all, all sorts of regulators and we haven't, we haven't been um, exceptional in that. But I think what it has illustrated is um, the opportunities we've had to work together and, and to share knowledge and to share best practice. And, you know, for me uh, and I think for Marty, we, we're just uh, massively impressed by the way our, our staff have, have, uh, have risen to the challenge. Uh, there's nothing that we've thrown at them that they haven't done from knocking on doors, talking to people about chickens, to sticking their head down um, sewers to, to take up cigarettes and, and the rest. And there is a lot more that we could have said to you this morning that we do do that we haven't had time to. So thank you for listening. Um, Martin and, and my contact details are on the slides for you to look at at a later date. Um, I believe, Stuart, is, is it questions and answers if there are any? Hello, Hello. thank you, Mike and Martin. Um, that was a great presentation. Uh, we, we haven't had any questions in the the chat, but if anybody on the call does have any, please feel free to raise your virtual hand and we'll address them uh, now. Um, I think that was a really good summary. Oh, we've got we've got a, a hand from Scott. Off you go, Scott. 
Hi guys, really, really good presentation. Thank you. Um, I, I wonder because it would probably be of interest to to others on the call, but I wonder if you, either of you could share a little bit about um, the, the powers that Trading Standards Office officers have, and because it's I'm sure it's confusing sometimes where uh, we work with the police to do things, but we also I know also have the ability to do uh, to interview people under caution, and um, uh, you know so there's there's powers there that are very similar to those that the police have. Um, but just share a little bit of a little bit about that because it might be of interest to everyone. Oh, shall I pick that up, Martin? Well, yeah. Um, if if I thank you, Scott. If 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 I illust illustrate um, the powers thing by reference to our our, our visit to, to the market in relation to counterfeit goods, so we're looking at um, the Commission of Criminal Offences, and 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 in, in this case, it would be under under the Trademarks Act. So Scott's right, quite right. Um, different enforcement bodies have different powers. Now, in that instance, we were working with the police. The police have powers of arrest. The police can enforce the provisions of uh, the Trademarks Act, but we would be using the police in that instance to prevent breaches of the peace and to support us in seizing evidence. Now, as um, we're investigating any criminal offence, it's subject to the, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. So uh, trading standards officers in, in conducting their investigations have to be mindful of this piece of legislation. Um, codes of practice there under uh, say how we conduct our investigation. Uh, if we do interview people and we do ask them questions about um, what they've done in relation to that criminal offence, then we are obliged to interview them under caution. And you'll be familiar with the, the, the usual words that we have to say to them to caution that you do not have to, have to say anything, et cetera, et cetera. So that um, piece of legislation governs the way in, in which we work the way we talk to suspects and the things we can ask them and the way we can uh, obtain evidence and the way we can use that evidence in in, in legal proceeding after. But there are also a whole suite of other powers that, that, that we have. We have powers to inspect documents. We have power to seize uh, items that we think should be maybe used in evidence. We can um, visit a wide array of premises at reasonable hours to inspect what's going on there and we can also enter premises with with warrants uh, and we can you know do what you see on, on the telly break down doors and and and, and, and see stuff um, but we we can also on the flip side of it um, issue uh, fixed penalty notices and we will be doing that with them um, with lettings companies for breach of tenants fees act so there's a whole range uh, of, of powers that we have in, in, in our toolkit to, to, to do the work that we do. Does that help, Scott? Yeah, that's brilliant, guys. Thank you. Good. So I, uh, we've got no more virtual hands. So um, I, from my perspective, I think that was a really good summary of the, the broad range of work that uh, trading standards do. Each time I watch this, I'm impressed by the broad range of subject areas. Um, and you've shown some really interesting examples of where things have gone wrong and you've had to take enforcement action. Um, but obviously, naturally, you, your objective is, is to try and stop things going wrong. So uh, that early interaction and support to businesses, I know, is a key part of, of your, your work. Uh, now, there are some growth advisors on the call who may discuss some of these regulatory areas with businesses at, at an early stage. Um, I'm thinking particularly about product safety, labelling and claims, mm -hmm. etc. Um, uh, and the business, those businesses may require advice and support to help them comply. So I'm just wondering what, uh, just a quick question, what if growth hub advisors, particularly in um, uh, Warwickshire and, and Coventry, have got a business like that, what's the best way for them to to direct the businesses to for further support? Basically, they need to contact the authority, the relevant authority. So obviously our colleagues at Coventry would deal with companies based there. Traditionally, you always approach the authority where you pay your business rates to um, for advice. Um, that's sort of the common indicator. Um, and then we will give free advice up to a point. Um, it depends what it is. If, if people are starting out, then we'll help them as much as we can. 
Um, but if it's a big established business wanting further direction, then we can give some support. But then we'd probably try and encourage them to maybe formulate a, a, a primary thoughts relationship whereby um, there's a formal setup which has uh, got a legal footing about how we work together and we could charge for that advice and it's not necessarily open ended. It's, it's fixed. It's got um, particular parameters to it, but it's a good way forward of, of getting assured uh, advice. Um, and then it helps our colleagues out in the field as well to know that the, the same advice is across the company. Um, so if it's a big operation across the UK, then the same rules apply across the UK. Um, having said that, sometimes there are variations on certain rules, particularly say with animal health, for example, in the different countries, Wales, Scotland, etc. And so um, all the advice we can give is England only. But in the bigger picture of product safety, which is UK wide, then it'd be a, a national basis that would give that information. So um, it's horses for courses from that point of view. Um, and like was indicated um, earlier by uh, us with the allergens, that's something new. When there is new legislation on the horizon and coming in, then we're trying to be proactive with business anyway and advise them what's coming in. So, um, you know, we try and help as much as we can. From that point of view, doing publicity and a bit of campaign work and some direct um, maybe mail shots, etc. Thank you, uh, Martin. Um, so that that we've run out of time. I do apologise for for going slight slightly over. Um, but like I say, if um, it is recorded, so people can can catch up if they've had to leave early. Um, uh, so yeah, thanks again, Mike and Martin. Uh, really good presentation. Really appreciate your time. Um, I have posted details of the uh, sessions happening this afternoon. Well, the session that's happening this afternoon, um, tomorrow and Friday, uh, along with our email address. Should you have any problems with with any of the links or finding the the schedule. Um, so yeah, um, I'll I'll end the session there. Uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Bye-bye.